Starting a newsletter is hot right now. It's very difficult to make a good newsletter. Yeah, a lot of people quit, but that's just like any content in general. You start a podcast, start tweeting. 99% of people are not going to continue. And that's why it's a good reason if you're going to start a newsletter, start something that's, that's somewhat simple to write every week. So that's probably a good strategy to go into it starting off. Let's start for, from the beginning. Like, I'm at 27K. It's unbelievable that a lot of these people have like 250K, 100 plus K. Like, I would love to hear from you. Like, how the heck are they starting from zero? I can go through my journey, but you've seen newsletters go from zero to hundreds of thousands. Like, what the heck are they doing to grow these things? Yeah, it's really impressive. Um, <laughs> 27K is huge. I mean, it's, it's like, looks small compared to these other ones, but that's still a massive, massive audience, right? And yeah. a big business can be built on top of a list that's 10K, right? But so yeah. what do the big newsletters do to get there? So people I'll be talking about would be like The Hustle. It's at like 2.5 million now. Milk Road is at 250K. I worked with them. People like Cody Sanchez yeah. and Sahil Bloom are people I've worked with too. They're both at north of four or 500K for their newsletters. And they're just like personal brand newsletters. Yeah. So how do they get there? One is like it doesn't happen in a couple months. Like all of these lists have, I think they've been doing this for over like a minimum of four years. So it's a long-term thing. Yeah. Um, the way I like to think about it is I really break it down into three different growth channels. And so all, all newsletter growth really comes from these three different buckets or channels. So number one is um, social growth. And so growing your audience on social, like Facebook, YouTube, really not Facebook anymore, but Twitter, YouTube, LinkedIn, growing that audience there, getting followers and subscribers on those platforms and then converting them into newsletter subscribers. So yeah. that's social audience growth. Number two, which I help a lot with is paid growth. So running yeah. ads on Facebook, Instagram, et cetera, to get subscribers. And then number three is one that's not really talked about a lot, but it still can be really effective, which is email platform growth. So this is like having an email referral program, have asking people to forward your newsletter to friends and they can sign up that way or cross promoting within other newsletters or cross recommending with other newsletters where they see an ad for another newsletter after they sign up for your newsletter. So that's mm -hmm. email platform growth. That one's usually the smallest of the three, but can be a great source of quality subscribers because they're coming from other newsletters. So they're much yeah. more likely to read yours because they're already a newsletter person yeah um i'm curious on that referral like what what are some of the cool referral things that people are doing like that's what i'm curious about how are how are they creating that loop of getting people to actually refer to their friends which as you know those referrers are probably worth i mean a lot more because their friends you know asking them the yeah so their friends cool. they're recommended they're really yeah. high quality subscribers when i was at the house i managed our, our the referral program there and um, a lot of people really struggle with it. A lot of people look at like what Morning Brew did where they have like, you know, five referrals, you get a sticker, 10, you get a hat, 15, you get a t-shirt. Uh -huh. That doesn't work anymore. It's, it's the novelty has worn off of that. Um, and so what I recommend is having um, low, easy to, to achieve referral rewards for low referrals. So giving away something when someone gets one to three referrals, yeah. ideally like one, three, five. So it's very achievable because very few people are gonna refer 15, 20 people to your newsletter. Like how many, you don't know 15 or 20 people that are interested in like <laughs> the same topic. It's not really possible, right? True. true. Um, that doesn't mean you can't have a reward for them too, but really focus on making really great rewards that are very achievable, like one to three referrals. And so what works best is usually digital products. So that could be like an ebook, a checklist. Um, if you like think about lead magnets, yeah. Um, the same type of thing that would work as a lead magnet works really well as a referral reward. So that, that same type of digital product, like a PDF like that. Another one that works really well is shout outs. So oh. um, I have a friend that runs this news that are called Naptown Snoop or Naptown Scoop, excuse me. Yeah. And um, he has like, if you refer one person, you get a shout out when it's your birthday in the newsletter. Um, oh, Chanel of Growth and, Growth and Reverse does like, if you refer five people, you get a shout in our newsletter and she'll give a link to your newsletter or your website so people can go and check that out. So that type of like cross promotion or like shout out um, marketing works really well for, for referral rewards too. But wow. it's like, it's stuff like that. Yeah, inter this is interesting because I'm, I'm thinking through this too. And my first referral is a digital product. It's like 13 email sequences that like sell like crazy, right? It's just a lead magnet that essentially I made for I like the that. referral thing, right? Um, and people love that one, but as you're, you're right. Like, I think I have a piece of swag for like the, for that you can get like a distribute piece of swag, but you have to refer 15 people and you've made a good point. I'm kind of like, shoot. I mean, it's cool, but like what I, I don't even know 15 people, <laughs> you know, like did I refer the stuff to? So it's actually yeah. kind of common sense, but we forget about it a lot of the time, you know? And I think it's okay to have that as long as you have that low tier reward. Um, yeah. it's nice to give something like 
very like less than 1% of people are going to get to 15. Another thing that works really well is referral giveaways. Have you seen these? I ran a lot of these at the hustle morning brewers ran a lot of these too. Ooh. Um, it's really simple. So basically you say you, you give away a prize. What worked best for us was Apple products, like a MacBook, AirPods, stuff like that. People love that. And you basically say, um, during this time period, it's usually a seven to 14 day window. When you refer a person for every successful referral that you get, you get one entry to win. And so the more referrals that you get, the more entries you get to win the contest. So it incentivizes more referrals, but it also still gives people a, sh a shot at winning, even if they just have one referral. So it doesn't discourage people who don't have the ability to share. So those work really well. You can't do those every month, but if you can do those like once a quarter, they're really effective. Uh, and uh, so once a quarter is kind of that giveaway. And so just so I understand, it's like yeah. the, they, they do the entry to win for like a three month period or they're only doing it for a seven month period or I'm sorry, a seven day period. Oh, like seven day. Yeah. Seven day. Yeah. Keep it short. Okay. Keep it short. Yeah, Keep it short. Because like if you do it 30 days, it's too long. People forget about it. Yeah. But it, what happens if you do it seven to 14 days, you know, you'll get a lot of referrals when it first start. And then in the last like 24 or 48 hours, you'll get a lot of referrals then because of that urgency because the, the prize mm -hmm. is, is ending soon. You, mm -hmm. you have to refer now to get in. Yeah. When. So I like that time period. Nice. And the people, they're doing that every, they're, once a quarter, they're kind of doing that type of giveaway. Could be more once or twice a quarter. Yeah. You, if you do it constantly, people are going to get tired of it. Right. Yeah. Um, but it works. And so it sounds like some of these like pros like yourself, they're just always testing new referral systems. Yeah. And you can test different prizes too. And also with that, you're still giving away the, 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 you know, the one tier prize, the 15 tier prize that you have. So it's a bonus on top of that as well. That's the referral giveaway stuff, which is amazing. Now let's go into the pay side because I follow your newsletter if, if for anyone listening here definitely I'm gonna start recommending Matt on the back end here it's called growth operator right Matt a newsletter growth operator well I have too many names so newsletter operator is the newsletter name okay. and then I have an agency called grow letter okay there that's right okay yeah. <laughs> there we go so y'all go check that out but okay so it's amazing. Like I read every one of your basically your newsletters that come out because it's very what I like about it is it's super tactical, right? It's not like super fluffy, top of funnel, like, hey, you know, like the consistency is what matters. It's like, no, it's like, hey, here's exactly how to set up your Facebook campaigns. And here's some actual ads that I'm running now that you can like go make go copy basically and run yourself, right? Yeah. Which I which I like because it's like, yes, I can go like implement this now. So um, with that, you go into paid stuff in your newsletter. How the heck does someone start from zero on paid? Like I'm personally trying to figure this out right now. So this is where I'm curious. Where should we, st where should someone start if they want to do paid? And then what the heck should they start doing? Like, I just want to hear from the beginning, right? Beginner kind of. Master. Yeah, I can break it down. Sure. Um, there's a lot of common pitfalls, but I'll help. I'll, I'll walk you through how to avoid those. Yeah. Um, and one of the, one of the, problems people get really scared of paid or they have problems with it is because if you miss one kind of step in the steps that I'll walk through, it's not going to work at all. Versus like if you're just posting on Twitter and like not every post is great, you know, you'll still like get better over time, yeah. but you can really screw up your paid marketing if you just forget to do something, if you don't totally understand it. Yeah. So you have to understand the process and I'll, I'll walk you through it. And honestly, I'll, I'll do the best I can, but it is really probably best to go and check out one of my blog posts because there are all, all the, like the small details are really important when it comes to yeah. ads. Um, but so, so we'll start with like what platform to use. I like Facebook and Twitter. Um, I would say Facebook ads, um, meaning Facebook and Instagram ads, just the ad platform is the best place to start for 99% of people. So, um, the good thing about that too, is if you learn Facebook ads, pretty much all the other ad platforms, except for Google ads, um, are built off the Facebook UI. Mm -hmm. So it will look really similar. Mm -hmm. Um, and so if you learn one, you can kind of learn them all to a degree. Um, so Facebook is great. You also have to understand what your objective is. So, right, so we're talking about getting newsletter subscribers. This can work for lead magnets too, or leads, but we'll just talk about newsletter subscribers in this. Yeah. Um, and so you really need to have a couple of things in place before you run ads. You need to have a great landing page. You need to have a thank you page. Um, and that thank you page, after someone subscribes to your newsletter, your landing page, they need to be redirected to a unique landing page. A lot of people don't have that. Um, a lot of times they subscribe and it just says, hey, thanks for subscribing. It shows a success message. You have to redirect them to a separate URL. And this helps make your tracking setup very easy. It also gives you the opportunity to pitch other products on the thank you page and to do other things there. Um, so you have to have those two things in place as well. Okay. And then the final thing is you have to add you know, the, the pixel to your site. It's actually pretty easy to do this nowadays. Like a lot of page builders 
you can just go into Facebook and copy and paste from the pixel ID. Mm -hmm. um, and so you want to add that pixel to all pages of your website, but it definitely needs to be on your landing page and thank you page. Yeah. yeah. Um, after that, you can set up your conversion tracking and you basically, like a lot of people overcomplicate this. They want to use like Facebook API conversions or like custom code and all this stuff. But all you need to do is have the pixel on both of those pages. And then you need to create a custom conversion of that, that tells Facebook when someone reaches my thank you page, they are a newsletter subscriber. So it's not super complicated. Yeah. A lot of people overcomplicate the tracking stuff. Yeah. Okay. Enough with that's like the very boring. No, no, no but it's a dude. It's a, to it's the, actual, the most uh, important because then you can't measure, you can't, if you don't have the conversion tracking set up, then you can't actually measure if your ads are working, <laughs> right? So then you yeah. don't know how to tweak it. And I've set this up multiple times. And, and all it is, is you just say, hey, someone has converted when the URL it ha contains thank you, right? And then like, it's, our, it, yeah. it's super simple to set up. Yeah, but most people miss this step. Yeah. yeah. And it, that works really well. Like people, it, that's actually, it's, it's a very accurate way to track. Um, a lot of people want to make it more complicated, but it's been working great for our clients. Yeah. Okay, so after you have that in place, you want to run a conversion campaign. Facebook now calls this a lead campaign. That's important too. You don't want to run a different campaign type like traffic because you'll get a bunch of traffic, but you won't get any conversions. And so you want to run the right campaign objective, which is leads or conversions. Well, why leads um, over conversions? Like, what's the does does it matter? Oh, those are, those are interchangeable. Okay. It's just Facebook keeps changing the word, so don't worry okay, about that. Okay, got it, got it. Um, yeah, because every time I see, it, I'm like, do I do lead or campaign? What the hell is the difference here? Yeah. Yeah, I believe the term they use now is leads, but like other platforms like Twitter, they call that conversions, but it's, it's those are the same yeah. thing. Um, okay, so we're gonna set that up. Like after that, you select your targeting. The best targeting now is broad targeting. So this is just when you select an age range in a, in a location and you just let Facebook decide to do the target, you leave it up to the Facebook algorithm, which works really well. And so what we like to do is kind of set like a minimum age range, sometimes a maximum. Um, like, you know, if people are not buying your product who are under 25, you know, set a minimum of 25. Yeah. And if people are not buying who are over, you know, 60, set a maximum of 60. Sometimes you can go broader than that. That works well. So broad targeting works really well. The other best type of targeting is interest-based targeting, which is pretty straightforward. You kind of think about all the things your audience would be interested in. So, um, you know, for me, that's like marketing, um, software like MailChimp, Beehive, stuff like that. You search those in the Facebook drop-down menu and you select those and they can also give you more suggestions. Um, it's important that you select the right audience size too. So like you want to have enough interest in there so your audience isn't too small. Yeah. I recommend a three to 30 million audience size if you're doing interest-based targeting. If you're doing broad targeting, the audience is going to be much bigger because it's literally going to be like anyone above 25 in the US, which is hundreds of millions of people. Yeah. Right? Finally, the, the, the most important part is ad creative. And we could have a whole call about this, so I won't. Yeah, this is, what is where I really have questions. Yeah, we, we can, I'd love to get to your questions on this, but like what really works best now is video creative. And it's hard to make video creative because it's, you know, you can make an image in Canva very easily. You can hire a designer, but making a video is way more difficult, but it's worth figuring out the time and money it takes to do that. And so yeah. the way I do that for our clients is we work with actors or a lot of times they call themselves the UGC content creators, but they're basically actors, yeah. right? Um, they have a TikTok account, but they probably make most of their money by filming new videos for brands, whether it's e-commerce or media or newsletters or whatever. And so those videos aren't super expensive. You're looking at on the lower end, you can get like a video for a hundred bucks. On the higher end, if you want to get something really well produced, it can be like 250 bucks. It's expensive, but it's not uh, unaffordable for a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. And okay. so what we like to do is test two to three different videos. Sorry, question on that. Sorry for cutting you off. I'm just so yeah, curious. Absolutely. How do you find these UGC creators? Like, are you literally just DMing them or like, is there a network you use or how do you do this? Yeah, good question. It's easier than a lot of people think Fiverr, like they've all kind of went to Fiverr. And so if you go to Fiverr, search UGC actor, UGC creator, there's dozens of different ones you can choose from. And they're actually really good quality. Um, Fiverr isn't known for its quality, but like this type of gig on Fiverr works really well. And so what I recommend is just like, don't look at the ad they make for themselves. If you ever see on Fiverr, like people will make an ad for their gig. It's like, hey, I'm mad, I'm a UGC creator. Yeah. That usually looks really good, but it can be deceiving. You want to go and look at their examples of client work and see the, the video ads they made for other people. If those are good and those are natural and authentic, they're probably good to work with. If they sound robotic, which is a common problem, and they sound low energy and they sound just like it, like it's obviously an ad, you want to avoid that person. So we're looking for natural, authentic, something that looks native to like uh, TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, et cetera. You want, you want something like that. Yeah, got it. And so, okay, Fiverr. You know what? I didn't even think about going to Fiverr. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. And so they're filming like, they're not doing super high quality like edits or anything. It's just them talking about your product basically like saying, 
hey, I found this cool thing and it's a lead magnet creator and, you know, you can help you generate leads. That's, it's kind of talking head stuff, them walking on the street. Right? Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of like selfie style or just like mount a camera, um, you know, in their house. And that works best because it comes off as authentic, yeah. right? It's usually good to write a script for them rather than have them do it from scratch. Although a lot of them can write the scripts for you. I do recommend writing the script yeah. yourself. And I have a whole guide on how to do that, but it kind of, and we can talk about script writing too and get into that, but it kind of comes down to three parts. Like the most important part is having a strong hook. Yeah. If, if you are on TikTok or yeah. Reels nowadays, like every every video you watch has a really yeah. clickbaity hook. Um, and so we want to create that for our product too. And so we want to be able to grab attention in the first five seconds with nice. that. And um, sometimes it's good to even have like, use the same video of multiple hooks. That works yeah. really well as well. Works really well too. So yeah, that's important. So basically you have a hook, you have your, your, the middle of your video, which is like where you explain the product and the benefits yeah. of the product or in the newsletter. And then the final part of the video is just a call to action. You know, click here to subscribe for free, click the link below, nice. stuff like that. I have a whole guide on how to write scripts on my, on my website. People can check out, but that's nice. kind of the and that's free on your website. Super complicated. Right? And, like on the, yeah. Yeah. Newsletteroperator.com. Yeah. And you want the video to be under 30 seconds. So you don't need to write a super long right, script, right. you know, like even less than that, like 15 to 25 seconds can work really well. How many video ads should you do from the, for the, from these UGC creators? Like, are you, are you doing three at a time? You say you're testing and then how yeah, long two to three is fine. For? Okay. Got it. Two to three is fine. Yeah. Two to three is fine. And so what I might do is like we do two to three different videos, two to three different yeah. images, and then maybe two different copy variations. I think this is where it gets a little bit more complicated, but it's not super, yeah. super complicated. So you want to be spending enough to get enough conversions. So usually we set the minimum spend to like $35 per day at the bare minimum. Usually we start at $50 per day with yeah. most clients. So you don't have to spend a ton. Um, sometimes if you're on a really tight budget, you could spend like 25 bucks yeah. a day too. So it's flexible. And so we want to let that, those ads run for usually three to seven days to see how they perform. And so what you'll see over that time period is some of them will get a lot of impressions and conversions. Some won't get any impressions and um, some will be at your target CPA or below and some will be higher. And so after three to seven days, you can reevaluate if you want to pause some of those ads that maybe have too high of a CPA. And if you, if you did that, you can go and test more after that. So that's kind of how you do it. It doesn't take very long to see results. Yeah, a few a days at 50 bucks a day. So let's say three to three to seven days or whatever, three days. Interesting. Okay. And I went through your course, right? You sent me a, a course that I don't know if you have it out officially yet. Um, so maybe I got, I got exclusive access. Who knows? Uh, but in there, you, you measure, you, you mentioned the four metrics that you kind of look at. And let me pull it up. You have CPM, which is cost per 1,000 impressions, CTR, landing page CVR, and then frequency, right? Yeah, I can explain what those mean. So like you mentioned CPM already, which is cost per 1,000 yeah. impressions. CTR is click-through, right? So what percentage of people that saw your ad actually yeah. clicked it? CVR means conversion rate. So what percentage of people that visited your landing page actually subscribed? And then the final one is frequency, which is how many times a day someone saw yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. And then, so what are what are your like? What are you aiming for? Yeah. So we need benchmarks yeah. around there. Yeah. So the Facebook benchmarks are, are pretty simple, and then this also really helps describe like th this helps you evaluate if your ads aren't working, why they are not yeah. working. And so CPM, we ideally want a ten dollars CPM or less. Sometimes people get higher CPMs, but ten dollars or less. Click through rate, we want one point five percent unique click through yeah. rate or higher. Um, conversion rate, we want a 45% conversion rate or higher on our landing page. And then frequency, which is probably the least important of those four, we want 1.2 or less. So no more than 1.2 times per day someone sees your ads. And so why this is important is because if your um, conversion rate is too low, your landing page sucks. You have to improve your yeah. landing page. So if it's below 45%, work on your landing page, yeah. get it higher, right? You can do split testing. You can just kind of start from scratch. Honestly, if it's really bad, you probably even shouldn't do a split test. You should probably just fix it and try and make something yeah. completely better. Okay, so CVR CVR bad, landing page bad. If your click-through rate is below 1.5%, your ad creative is bad because no one's clicking on it. Yeah. So if that's the case for your ads, you have to make better ads to get that yeah. click-through rate up. And then finally, the one that's a little bit more of a black box is CPM. This is how much Facebook charges us to get a thousand impressions. And it's not completely within our control, right? But usually if you improve your conversion rate in your landing page and you improve your ad creative, your CPM will actually get lower. And so that's how you do it. One reason your CPM might be high too is if your audience is too small. And so if you target an audience of like a thousand people, you're gonna have a really high CPM or even a million yeah. people. And so that's why we wanna have a minimum audience size of over three million. Got it, people. got it, okay. And then the, for the landing page conversion rate, right? Cause mine, mine now for an ad I'm running is 25%, right? And so what are the common mistakes that you think people are making? And all mine is, is just like, it's a lead magnet challenge, right? Is what I'm doing. I'm, I'm messing around with this lead magnet challenge. 
five day lead magnet challenge um, to get people in and then we use distribute, right? That's like the whole goal. And with that, yeah. what I'm doing is yes, 25%. And when they land on the page, it's just an opt in and like, a, a, I think an image or something. Yeah, I like the simple pages. So I, I have to look at it. I think you're on the right track there. I can speak to some yeah. common mistakes. So I recommend, or especially for a newsletter or a lead magnet, we're just collecting the email address or maybe the name in the email address. You basically want it to be like a one section page. Everything above the fold, basically I can see the impact tire page looking at my phone or in my, my desktop. I don't have to scroll yeah. at all. It's even better if there's no yeah. scroll, I think. And so the elements you want to have are basically like a headline, subheadline, form, button below the form, and maybe some copy or testimonials or images beneath that or on the side, but that's pretty much it. Um, and so make sure it's, it's that type of landing page. Like don't make it very long. Um, of course, we have to look at it on a mobile too. Like the mobile experience for your landing page is more important than the desktop, of course, because a lot more people are going to see it there, especially yeah. with ads. Yeah. Right. And then there's a lot of others. I, ha I have a whole other article on, on landing pages that I can break down. But th the key thing is just like having a clear benefit that someone's going to get right away when they join, including that in your headline. Right. And so that's really the most important thing. If you, if you can show how you're going to help people immediately within the headline, they're more likely to subscribe. Um, if it's more vague, it's a little bit harder. Like a lot of people in the newsletter space, they just put like, join my newsletter or Matt's newsletter. And they don't, they describe like what their newsletter is, but not how it's going to help. Mm -hmm. people. And so focusing on benefits and, or maybe how your lead magnet or newsletter solves a problem will get you better results. Um, but th there's a lot to it and there's also not a lot to it. You know what I mean? The planning yeah. pages, like it's, it's a pretty simple thing, but there's lots of nuances. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. And then, okay. And then let's say like we do this test, we get on Fiverr, we hire a few creators, we test three to five ads. Um, we find a couple winning ads, right? We're like, Ooh, this one, great click through rate. Great. You know what? Our landing page conversion is fine. Actually, what should we focus on first? Right. I, I, I'm guessing, before we get to landing page conversion, you should probably focus on click-through rate, right? Uh, really all yeah. at the same time. So like we talked about, you know, getting our ads up and letting them run for three to seven days to see how they perform. So after that seven days, we'll say, we want to look at our all those four metrics yeah. we talked about, click-through rate, conversion rate, et cetera. And then at that point, we can improve those to make our ads yeah. better, right? So after seven days of our conversion rate's bad, we would address that. But also you might have two problems. You might have a low conversion rate and a low click through rate. So you, you have to address both at the same time. Yeah, right. Okay. And so say we had a, um, you know, say we were doing this and we find a winning ad, right? We're like, oh, this click through rate's insane. It's awesome, uh, right? Like everything looks good. What do you then do with that ad? Do you do you take it and then put it into a winning ad set or kind of like what's your process once you find something that's working? Do you turn off the other ad and then test two more in yeah. the same ad set? Or what's kind of your, your strategy? You can do that. So I think about it, the ad set level, like if you have an ad that's at or below your target CPA and you're happy with it, you probably don't want to add more ads to it because if it's not broke, don't fix it. Right. So what you can do is if you want to increase the spend, you can do that. You can increase the spend by 20% per day and get more subscribers from that ad. Another thing you can do is try and get even better results. And so when you have a working ad, what I like to do is for, for let's say it's a video yeah. ad, for example, you know, analyze the copy in that video and turn that into an image ad or vice versa. If you have an image that's working, what's the copy in that image? What, how, why is it working well? And how can we make that into a video? And so just switch up the format. So that's yeah. one way you can do it. Interesting. Um, and so you're basically making more ads that can nice. work Nice, and then do you do that in a separate um, ad set or are you doing that in the same ad set? So if it's at or below your, C, your target CPA and you're happy with that, I would do it on a separate ad set just so you're not, you're with not messing yeah. with anything that's working yeah. well. If, you're, if, you have, if the results are kind of not up to par, um, you can do it in the same ad set because it's not going to get any worse by testing something new. It's only going to get potentially better. So people call it gardening. Um, you kind of like managing the Facebook ads is kind of like a gardening experience. Like you want to water things, you want to prune some things, but there's not an exact mathematical yeah. system to it. And then you might have mentioned this, but what was what was the CP CPA, which is the cost to get someone to give you their their email, basically in in the newsletter case, right? For a free newsletter, it, what's your target for that? Was it four bucks or something like that? Or you know, target would be dollar obviously yeah, but talk about like this. yeah as low as possible yeah. of course so our average client cpa at girl letter is two dollars but it depends on your newsletter right you know if, if you have a hundred dollar cpa but like everyone's buying that's a great cpa so it, de it depends on different mm -hmm. factors right usually people are pretty happy with a two dollar cpa but you know if, you, if you're a b2b newsletter with a small high value niche audience a three dollar cpa might be good if you're a really broad newsletter it's just about like lifestyle or like sports or something you might want a 150 CPA or even even lower a CPA than that. So it all depends. But like for U.S. audiences, usually two dollars is really great. Um, but 
less or more depending on your audience type. Wow, interesting, super interesting. And then you're you're basically testing creative until you can you can get to that CPA, right? Like that's that's the goal there. Um, testing that creative. testing creative, testing landing pages with mostly, mostly creative, creative, right? And then the UGC stuff, the video stuff. How now on that? How, are you ever doing like fancy edited videos, right? Where it's like super edited or anything like that, or you're mostly just sticking to the UGC stuff? We keep it pretty simple. So like we edit the UGC, we have an editor in house. Sometimes the UGC creators want to do editing themselves and they're really good at it. So like we, we basically have like some zoom in. I'm not a great editor, but we have some zoom in and outs. We have some cuts. We definitely have subtitles every video. Subtitles are really important. We have background music for every video, mm -hmm. um, but that's pretty much it. We've tested like some fancy animations. I prefer not to use those. I think less yeah. is more. And so that's my philosophy. All right. Amazing. So now I think something interesting Matt, that I, I personally want to learn is how are people using lead magnets, right? Um, and you probably knew this question was coming, but um, what, what are some different lead magnets that you're seeing some of your clients use or that have worked super well uh, in order to get subscribers specifically? It varies a ton. I mean, Saha and Cody Sanchez have had a lot of success with lead magnets. Um, depends on, like, they both have different things that they do with different yeah. audiences. You know, a lead magnet's worked well for Cody is like, I think it's like 126 different boring business ideas. Uh, and so that's what her audience uh -huh. wants. And um, I think the type, like Alex Ramosi has some great philosophies about lead magnets that I, that I like. Usually they, what he says is they solve like a narrow problem. And so like for Cody, like she's giving you the business ideas, but she's not going to teach you how to do every business. You have to read her newsletter and buy her products to learn how to do the business mm -hmm. stuff, right? Mm -hmm. um, but we're, we're solving one part of that problem. I also like it to be really easily consumable. And so like, it, like the 126 business ideas, it's like a two to three page PDF. That's it. Like you don't want to give someone a 10 hour course in the lead magnet because they're like, they're just getting to know you. They just became a lead. They're not going to commit that much time and effort into a course or a, a 50 yeah. page ebook. So usually the shorter, very actionable, technical things work well as lead magnets. Every audience and niche is different, but that's kind of how I think about it. The process for getting someone to sign up is like, is very similar to yeah. the newsletter, right? And are you running paid to these lead magnets or are they mostly using them on social? Like just posting them on social and using Both, they work yeah. well as both, yeah. Um, yeah, Sawhill is like crushed it on social with his lead magnets. We haven't actually done as much paid with his lead magnets um, just because his newsletter ads have worked so yeah. well. But Cody, we do a lot of lead magnet ads and those have our lowest CPAs, cost per subscriber, right? Um, sometimes as low as like 96 cents less than wow. um, per subscriber from lead. Wow. Magnet. And that's just paid straight to the lead magnet. Oh, wow. Insane. Insane. Okay. We've talked about Facebook. What's your take on Twitter now? Like what, what, I know Twitter's finicky right now, right? Elon's trying to figure it all out. Everything's going on. Like what's the strategy on, on Twitter as it stands today? Uh, I'm sure in the future, it's just going to become like Facebook exactly like it. Uh, right. And so he'll probably just copy that identically, but like, wh where does it stand today? What are you doing? Are you doing audiences? Like what's the process look like for you right now? It's pretty similar. Yeah. So the layout and like UI is pretty similar. The ad platform is it's, it's not as advanced at all, right? The targeting isn't mm -hmm. very advanced. Um, it's kind of lacking some quality of life features, um, that make it a little bit more difficult to work with. But the, the reason Twitter is worth looking at right now is because the cost is ridiculously low. Like, our CPM on Twitter cost per 1,000 impressions is like less than $2 on Twitter. On Facebook, our average is 10 or more dollars. And so almost 10x less expensive on Twitter um, to get someone to view your content. That doesn't mean your Twitter ads are going to be more effective than Facebook yeah, ads, unfortunately. Yeah. But we've had comparable results. So a lot of times we'll have similar CPAs on both platforms, but sometimes we'll get higher quality subscribers and more customers from Twitter than we do with Facebook. So usually for clients we work with now, we usually test both Facebook and Twitter. And so if someone really wants to dabble in both, I, I think that's a good idea. But if someone's really just getting started and they don't have a lot of time, Facebook is still the best platform. Yeah. Twitter can work well if like your audience is definitely on Twitter. So like a lot of the AI newsletters and AI publications we've worked with, they just crushed on Twitter because that's where that audience is. Same thing with like sports or fantasy football or yeah. stuff like that. What do you, how are you targeting people? Are you still doing super broad on Twitter right now? Or are you doing interest targeting? Oh, good question. It's different. Yeah. yeah. So broad targeting is, doesn't work on yeah. Twitter. Um, what Twitter has is called follower look like audiences. So you can go and look at, you know, Andy's Twitter account, Matt's Twitter account, whatever big influencer you want. And you can select them and you can target a lookalike of their followers. And so what you want to do is find Twitter accounts that your audience is following and select those in your targeting options. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's what I recommend doing that. That's the type of audience targeting that works yeah. best. And you probably want to have an audience size of just like Facebook, three to three, three to 30 million people. So you want to add enough 
Twitter accounts to get to that audience size that you can target. Okay, interesting. So we got Facebook, we've got Twitter, we've done this. Okay, now next, so we've, we've talked about two buckets. We've talked about um, the paid. What, what was the other bucket you mentioned? We talked a little bit about referral programs, referral. so email platform growth, and we talked a lot about paid. One quick note on paid before we jump into another topic is like, we, we talked about like paying for subscribers, but like, what do you get back? We didn't really talk a ton about that. So like the way, the reason paid ads can work so well is because you can get that investment back very quickly. So for example, if we pay $2 per subscriber from Facebook or Twitter, we can use Sparkloop Upscribe, which we don't have to explain how that works totally. Yeah. Basically, you can recommend other newsletters and get paid for those recommendations. And you can earn $1 per subscriber, or sometimes more, sometimes up to two. Mm -hmm. And so if you pay 2 bucks per subscriber and you earn 2 bucks per subscriber, now your net cost to acquire a subscriber is zero. And that's very common. Um, we have a lot of clients getting like a break even cost when, when they're growing their newsletters. So yeah. that's why pay growth is so attractive right now is because you can do that. And then also you can sell those people your product where you're going to get even more ROI on them. Yeah. And the boost, right? Beehive has that. I think ConvertKit has that, uh, which is like, you know, someone subscribes to your newsletter and then you recommend someone to, you recommend the person subscribe to your newsletter to another one and then you get paid for that. Right. Is it yeah. It? Exactly. And the average earnings per subscriber is like a dollar or two dollars. So you can if you can get a subscriber for less than that, now you're breaking even or even profiting from your ad investment, which is awesome. Nice. And then interesting, and what is there a strategy there to pick which new newsletters you're boosting per se or like making money when you're referring subscribers to them? I'm guessing Yeah. So yeah, that's Sparkloop and Beehive, they kind of have data on like which ones are gonna give you the highest earnings per subscriber. Yeah. But it kind of works now where it's like algorithm based. So you want to add like as many recommendations as are relevant to your audience. And then Spark, Lube, or Beehive will pick the top ones for you and give you the highest earnings per subscriber. So you don't have to like do a lot of complex optimizations. You just add as many as you can, really. Yeah. Okay. And you're mentioning Spark, Lube. I'm going to kind of put you on the spot here because right now I'm using like the Beehive boosts. Do you recommend using the Spark Loop boosts instead? Like in Well, this is where it gets complicated because we're talking about both of these platforms you can use to monetize and to grow. So you can use them to monetize your audience or you can use them to buy subscribers. And so I like both of them. Um, Spark Loop is a little bit better for monetization right now in most cases. Um, and I like Beehive a little bit more for buying subscribers. Um, God. So there's pros and cons to each. Pros, yeah. So it just kind of depends. Wow. Okay. Matt, this has been amazing, my friend. Um, last thing before we head out here, because we talked about referrals, we talked about paid, and the last one is just social. Like, sh you know, sharing, I guess, growing your newsletter just from doing organic social posts, right? What have you seen work? What doesn't work there, right? And I, there's probably a lot of things that don't work, <laughs> but well, what's the strategy there for people like Sahil or Cody? Is it just really you need a massive audience for it to really take off or what's that? You don't, you don't need a massive audience. I think one people miss is just having enough call to actions for the newsletter and having the right call to actions. Um, so for example, I, I don't have a big social audience. I've grown to like 12,000 um, Twitter followers but I also have almost 12,000 newsletter subscribers. And I have a very high per percentage of people that follow me that actually convert to the newsletter. And so uh, if you're able to have a high conversion rate like that, you don't have to have a huge audience to grow your newsletter a ton, right? Yeah. So I think I can't really speak to how people grow on social because there's so many different tactics and different content and audiences, right? Yeah. But what I can say is like most people don't have enough call to action. So like beneath your popular post, whether that's in a reply or in a comment, pretty much every post should have a call to action for your newsletter or for a lead magnet. Within your profile, you don't want to have a link to a link tree with multiple links. You should have a call to action for your newsletter or for a lead magnet. And that's how you get subscribers. And you should be including different promotions for your newsletter and lead magnet and giveaways in other places too to get subscribers. I think a lot of people just miss that. They like they keep posting, but they don't have clear call to actions and they don't do them often enough. Yeah, interesting. So it's just including those call to actions a little bit more, right? Which is like, hey, um, you know, under the con LinkedIn, what I do, sometimes I'll include in the post, right? If the post relates to something I'm writing in the newsletter, PS, if you want to see this in the newsletter, me dive more into this, here it is. But if not, I'll go to the comments on LinkedIn and I'll basically just say like, Hey, if you like this, you'll like my newsletter, uh, on go to market, you know, B2B go to market, whatever, here's the link. And then I'll get a good amount from there. Yeah. That's like most, you have to have that in every, like, 
one of those in every single post. A lot of people just don't have that. They do that like 10% of the time, but you're doing it every single time, which is important. Yeah. So that's really key. And also like optimizing your profile, like your profile is an ad to like follow you, but it's also an ad to click the link to go join your newsletter too. So yeah. um, you're going to get a lot of profile visits. So let's make sure we're converting those into subscribers and not just visits. You know yeah. I mean? Think of your profile like a landing page. So next thing here is like, let's talk about you figure you're getting subscribers, you're growing, right? And now you want to like, there's a classic uh, like ad slots that you can do, right? And like, let's talk about that because I think that's that's maybe the um, most common way, right? Is doing some of these ad slots for these. Yeah. Like how, and I'm sure this is a question a lot of people have, how the hell do you find people to sponsor this stuff? Like, is there a network? Is there, I think you posted a list of like the 10 most common companies that sponsor newsletters at one point. You had a tweet on that and like Masterworks yeah. and all these companies. Um, but what's the strategy there? Like, do these people have salespeople going after these companies to get ad slots or are, or is it mostly inbound? Like what's the whole thing there? It's a tough business model, honestly. And so one thing I'll say before I get into that is like, you got to think about other ways to grow your business outside of sponsorships because it's somewhat commoditized, right? It's just attention, right? So that's going to go towards the biggest newsletters out there. So you're competing with newsletters who have 100, 250,000, a million subscribers. And so like they're going to get the best sponsorship opportunities yeah. first before yeah. you do. And um, it's really hard to get lucrative sponsorship opportunities until you have 50,000 subscribers. You can start getting small ones at 10,000 subscribers, even less than that for some um, B2B niches. But like they're not going to be a ton of meaningful revenue until you're much bigger. And so it really is a game of scale and you have to get to that scale and size for you to have a lucrative sponsorship business. And a lot of newsletters, you can still have a seven figure business without that. So um, I'd, I'll, I'd love to like get into sponsorships, but that's just one thing I'll preference it with. Like newsletters really work best when you have a product you can sell people, whether that's an agency service or a software product or a course or consulting, whatever yeah. it may be. They really, newsletters really shine when you have that type of business model rather than just the media business. Yeah. But once you get to that level, like there's really just three ways to get sponsorship. It's really a somewhat simple um, revenue model. Like you either have um, outbound, so you reach out to advertisers who are advertising other newsletters. You have inbound, so you just let your audience know that you're available for sponsorships. So you have like kind of a promotional slot within your newsletter. You have something on the website yeah. footer in your website menu and social, just letting your audience know like if they want to sponsor it, here's more information so yeah. they can. And then the final one, would be other people selling your sponsorships. And so that could be listing your newsletter on a sponsorship marketplace like pave.com or swapstock.com or Beehive as an ad network and ConvertKit has an ad network. Or that could be working with sponsorship agencies to sell sponsorships for you and they'll take a commission of those. And so the agencies that I know best are MadRev and I think Ad Astra I've heard good things about too. Um, but basically they're just like commission only sales agencies. If you have a big enough newsletter, usually 50K plus subs, they'll work a few. They'll find you advertisers and they'll um, give those to you and just take a cut. There's no additional wow, cost. Okay. So those are the three ways. That's that's kind of so, what will work, work best. And it really comes down to number one most yeah, of the time. Yeah, okay, interesting. That's crazy. There's these ad agencies that basically go outbound and take a cut. Um, but you're saying it, it, until you have 50K, don't even worry about that. <laughs> Sponsorships are sort of like a CPM. So it's usually like a... $50 CPM is good. Sometimes $100 CPM is you can do if you're a B2B or have like a high value audience. You know, it's a 10,000 subscribers and a 50% open rate like that sponsorship rate. I don't know what that is. I think it's like, it's not a very lucrative sponsorship. You know, I forget, the, I have to actually do the math, which I won't yeah. do now, but like you're not selling sponsorships. Like you're, you're selling a lot of like hundreds of dollar sponsorships and you have to sell a lot of those to make enough money to pay. Yeah, yeah. You know I mean, they be start, they become much more meaningful when you're bigger, right? You can still start when you're, when yeah, you're smaller. A lot more meaningful. It's, it's, it's like if you sell like, you know, 1% one per, one of your audience buys like a consulting call if you were a course, that's much more meaningful revenue when you have 10,000. Yeah, dollars. interesting. Okay, got it, got it. And ne next on that is like, okay, so I want to ask, I want to put you on the spot again here, which is I've distribute, right? You, you've you seen distribute is it kind of, you know, we're early, but uh, essentially what we're doing is it's a lead generation platform. You create lead magnets, generate leads, et cetera. What are some tactics you think I can do from the newsletter, Andy's newsletter, in order to push people to get the SaaS? And I, I don't know how much you read Andy's newsletter, but regardless, like maybe even better if you haven't, right? Like just in general, what do you think, Matt, would be good ways to basically push people to that SaaS and use the newsletter as a growth engine? Yeah, so I'm just going to approach this as if um, I own it and I have no 
context on like the previous newsletters or like what you want to do with it or other factors. I'm only going to focus on selling yeah. distribute. So there's there's other factors in this, of course, too. So basically, I would see like what's what's our ideal audience for distribute? What do the customers look like? Um, and maybe tell me about that first. Like, are they creators? They're, are they are they salespeople? Media salespeople, companies? creators, and solopreneurs slash you know, so kind of creator slash solopreneur people who want to generate leads that don't rely on want to rely on a marketing team to do it for them. So. Solopreneurs don't have a marketing team. Yeah. Some salespeople that are like, well, I need to take things into my own hands, right? So it's, it's those people that see like, oh, I can create high value content and get emails for that for my newsletter or for, uh, I can call them, right? Get a meeting. So yeah. that, that would be the crowd. So I'll, for this purpose, I'll just focus in on like, I, it's hard to do a newsletter, but that serves every niche, right? I, pre I prefer just to focus on one niche. So let's just say we're going to focus on creators and solopreneurs and like small education yeah. businesses. And so who want to generate more leads and more subscribers so they can sell them something or sell sponsorships yeah. or whatever. And so I would just rebrand Andy's newsletter to be completely focused on that audience and basically deliver the same, like have a weekly newsletter that delivers value to them every week. So for example, that could be like every week I will share a tactic or strategy that's going to help you get more leads and subscribers for your business and focus on, it's going to get help, help you get more leads and subscribers for your solopreneur business or for your mm -hmm. creator business. So identify who it's for rather than just what it is. And so basically every every week, it doesn't have to be a long deep dive like I do sometimes, but just like one short tactic on how to use distribute to get more leads and just do that weekly newsletter over and over again. I would keep it really simple like that. Right now you have, I haven't read your newsletter in a couple of weeks, but like you have a lot of different stuff. It's like go to market strategies, um, social strategies, which, which could fit in distribute, but I would like dial it in really into just one good. thing related this is to the amazing. company. Yeah, yeah. So I think I think you're right. Like niching down per se, getting more specific on, hey, we help you grow, get more leads for your business, right? Um, and then getting every post to like go through how I do that with distribute, or specifically just in general tactics that I'm maybe trying to do that. Yeah, and it could just be breaking down different lead generation tactics, and like it could be someone else did a cool tactic. Maybe they didn't use distribute. Maybe they used a different tool to collect um, leads. But then you can say like, hey, you could have just do this, did this with distribute, and it would be easier, and like you can show why. The advantages yeah. of that. And so it doesn't have to Me. be just like how you use distribute. It can be like examples and breakdowns how yeah. other people do. Yeah. Um, you know, I was thinking about that this morning. Uh, shower thought. <laughs> I was like, shit, maybe I should get more guest people, guest posts on the newsletter. Right. It, I think it would work well. I mean, you've probably seen this more often than, than me, but like, because if it's, you probably want someone who has a big audience as well. Right. Cause then they might share it to their audience and say, Hey, I had a guest post in Nanny's newsletter. Like, is, is that a whole strategy that some of your clients are working on right now? And, or, and how do they think about that? Not as much. I think it's great, especially when you're, you know, when you have a newsletter of like 500,000 subscribers, you're not really going to do guest posts because it's just like too much exposure for a person. You really want control over the content. Yeah. But I think in that, like when you're growing zero to 100,000 range, it makes sense to do a guest post every couple of months. I've, I've done a few, especially when you're like writing it yourself every week and like you really need some yeah. help there. Um, I think it makes sense to have a, a like a, a group of people you guest post occasionally with and do like guest posts for each other uh, too. Smart. Yeah. To guest posts. So find the other people do guest posts and that could be a way to um, get, get subscribers there. So that's interesting. Too. Yeah. And it, they don't have to create new content for your newsletter either or vice versa. Like it could be something they wrote six months ago, but they make like an updated version of it for your newsletter. Yeah. And so as long as the content's valuable and relevant to the audience, that's fine. It doesn't have to be new every yeah. single time. It's more about value and how yeah, relevant it is. Yeah, interesting, amazing, amazing. Okay, well, Matt, uh, this has been amazing. <laughs> we just got a whole newsletter masterclass. The last question I'm gonna ask you before we go is, starting a newsletter is hot right now. And I feel like a lot, in there, it's very difficult to make a good newsletter, right? That someone, you know, it's hard enough making a good social media post. But making a good newsletter is hard. Like, it's hard for me, and I've been in this content game for a while. Like. What's your take on where the newsletter world's gonna go, right? Like, I, I have a feeling, just like anything, most 99% of people that start one are, you know, I'm not being a little pessimistic here, but they're gonna realize how hard it is and they oh, quit. Yeah. So like, w you know, what's your take on the future of, of this kind of newsletter uh, hype that, that's going on right now? Yeah, a lot of people will quit, but that's just like, yeah, content exactly. general. you start a podcast, start tweeting, 99% of people are, are not gonna continue. And that's why it's a good reason if you're gonna start a newsletter, start something that's, that's somewhat simple to write every week. So like, you're not gonna write you know, a long essay every week, you're going to write a five minute tactical guide or like you're going to share a certain number of links and you can start kind of simple. So you're not having this big, you know, six hour time commitment every week because most people are not going to commit to that. So that's probably a good strategy to go into it starting with. I, what I see in the future is a lot of like 
platforms like Substack and Beehive have ZC and has made it easier to start a newsletter. So a lot of people have jumped yeah. into it. And a lot of people, when the money isn't there, they'll, they'll stop. Um, and that's okay. But then the best people will continue to grow. So I kind of, when that happens, I'll be okay with it because there's just less competition. Yeah. <laughs> right? um, but I think in the long term, we will see a lot more newsletters, especially from the biggest and most prol- prolific creators and media companies, just because it's a necessity now. There's so much less traffic you're getting from social media that you have to have some type of owned audience, right? Yeah. Um, the traffic from Facebook and Twitter has gone down drastically to um, websites and media companies. And so you have to collect your audience's information and have a, have a one-to-one relationship with them somehow. And really the only ways you can do that are with newsletters, podcasts, or some type of um, private community online. And newsletters are probably the easiest and best way to do that. So. All right. Well, Matt, um, it's been amazing, my friend. Um, thank you so much for jumping on. We're going to push this to our newsletter. Everyone go follow Matt on Twitter. Uh, he's getting active on LinkedIn too. So I'm seeing that, you know, follow his newsletter, which is about how to grow a newsletter. I've learned a lot of stuff about general ad strategy from Matt. So, but we'll see you. We'll see you next time. Okay. Sounds good. good chatting with you, dude.